rain from another world. This is the spot where it was first seen, and these are the first people who saw the thing. How did it get here? Where did it come from? What is it? That thing's alive, sir. I saw it. I shot at it. I hit it. I know it. Nothing happened. It just kept coming at me, making a noise like a cat. I mean, Captain, it was awful. You could have seen those hands and those eyes. Captain, you've got to do something about it. You've got Is it human or inhuman? Earthly or unearthly? Baffling questions, astounding questions that not even the world's greatest scientific minds can answer. Gentlemen, do you realize what we've found? A being from another world, as different from us as one pole from the other. If we can only communicate with it. See? What happened, Doctor? In the greenhouse I was working, I couldn't see. Yeah. Then, then a blast of cold air and I heard Olsen scream. Come here. Get in the corner. Now hold this in front of you. Stay by the light switch. 1.9. Needles hit the top. everyone and welcome once again to geek fest france my name is carlos perone and joining me today i have mike and i also have mike over here today we are going to be covering one of our older films that mike suggested the thing from another world now this title might sound familiar to some of you our connection to this movie is we've done a lot of john carpenter films we've done some commentaries we've done some just general examinations of his films but this one is the one that's completely linked to The Thing. John Carpenter's The Thing. Obviously, this is the remake of that 1951 original film. Now, Mike, let's talk a, a little bit about the film. But before that, let's remind our audience where this film came from. So, Mike, where the heck did this story come from? Yeah, well, this movie was based on the short story Who Goes There by John Campbell. Campbell, I believe. 1939, I think. Like, Something like that, yeah. I think it first appeared... In Amazing Fantasy, uh, I can't remember. It's one of the old early sci-fi magazines that are out there, right? And it, because it was a short story, it was either part of the publication or a com or, or sometimes they sold them as a series of short stories on a book. So I don't think it was ever released as an individual story by itself. Yeah, actually, it appeared back in August of thirty-eight in the issue of Astounding science fiction wow so that's kind of like an amazing stories type of magazine i assume or, or yeah i believe it's one of those back again magazines that out there had did a lot of science fiction writing where a lot of the writers obviously just do a lot of early publications and because you got to keep in mind back then where is there an outlet for science fiction there was no sci-fi channel there's no television so i guess magazines was the way to go when you had a short story if you were important enough of a writer obviously you can publish your own book but for short stories, this was the place to go. Now, what's interesting about that story is that even though for this 1951 film, they take the basic story and translate it into a contemporary film for the time, the story resembles more the Carpenter version of the thing. And obviously, we're talking reverse well, here. You got to talk, right. Carpenter uh, <laughs> resembles more who goes there than the thing from another world. Correct. Yeah, you got to remember this is the first movie, yes. Right. John Carpenter did his remake based on the short story. But it's interesting because, and we'll talk about some of these things, there are certain things about this movie that they were able to carry on to the Carpenter version, and there are certain things they completely changed. So let's talk about this movie first on its own. It's 1951, well, it's a black and white film. Well, just to, to interrupt you a little bit, but yeah. was this the first time you ever saw the thing from another world? This is, well, let's say about a week ago is the first time I've seen it. This is technically tonight, the second time I've seen it. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I was very surprised by it. It makes sense why this is considered to be a classic of its time. In other words, if you take all these 50 sci-fi films, this one kind of stands out as far as I'm concerned, similar to Invasion of the Body Snatchers. You know, you take a classic Hitchcock black and white film, stuff like that. This pops up. It pops out. It, you know, it creates a certain suspense that 
you know, they try very hard to kind of hide the creature because the creature is the thing that kind of can make or break a movie. And here, they pretty much pull it off. They're able to hide it enough to create enough suspense. And technically, it's a horror film, I would imagine, but it's, it's heavy sci-fi also. Right. It's a science fiction movie, but yeah, it's got a lot of elements of horror. One of the things, when you finally get to see the alien creature when he's outside the door of the greenhouse, hopefully we're not ruining it for people who haven't seen the movie, he jumps out when you first see him, that's the whole point. You open the door, oh my god, the creature's right there. And there is rumors that Hawks did that on purpose. Kenneth Toby was one of the few actors that knew what was on the other side. They didn't tell the other actors on screen. So when they actually jump and, and move away, they're actually reacting to something that they didn't know about. The funny thing is that something that in the 70s, Steven Spielberg got a lot of credit for when he made Jaws, and that is, you know, you hide the creature, you hide the creature, you hide the creature, and don't deliver until the last minute. You know, he didn't invent that. That's something that's been around for a long time, and in this movie, for example, it works. The less you see of the creature, not only does it save the director from having to show you something that might not be 100% credible, but it creates this suspense that just keeps going all the way to the end while you actually see what this thing looks like all the way, you know, at the end of the movie. You see it a little bit at a time. You see the hand. You see the, the door opening, and he's there, but then they shut the door right away, so you don't get a really clear look at it. Well, you're talking about, you said before, it's a thriller kind of movie. I think it's a good thing it's a suspense movie than anything. As you say, Spielberg did that with Jaws, but technically, same thing with this movie, I believe. Spielberg did it because he couldn't get the shark working. <laughs> basically and in this movie i don't think they couldn't decide what creature the effects on the creature just wasn't working right right so they kept putting it off putting off so then they think okay it's obviously a guy in a suit basically but they put him in shadows you know, for a long time you didn't see him and if you did see him he looks like just a shadow creature right and i believe mike was telling us earlier about how uh they did try some of these earlier concepts but they didn't work out and if you go back to the original story who goes there the creature resembles more the john carpenter version it's not humanoid it absorbs people and it changes the shape of the body and the shape of, of whatever creature happens to be around for this particular movie they completely i guess decided to ignore that or avoid it because it was too difficult at the time is that true mike yeah i believe there is a rumor that uh, hawks did create a creature did some test footage looked at it they thought it was a little too grotesque and it just didn't work so they wanted wish to I change could see, it i wish we could see that yeah I, i've never heard if they've actually found it but there's mm. rumors that it's out there and but just to go back to your comment to you the know, hawks's style of writing if anybody who watches it and you listen it's a lot of character talking um, all the characters everybody's talking over each other and it's more like ordinary people so he was building more of the suspense of yeah the monster's there we're, we're stuck in the building but still I still always feel like he was dealing more with the characters, mm -hmm. not just the monster. But also you got to keep in mind, it's developing these characters, but you're developing these characters for that era. While I'm watching the film, there's a lot of things I'm noticing. It's like, oh my God, it sounds so much like a 50s melodrama or cop thriller. The way they deliver the lines, the way people act, it's a completely different style that, you know... When you look at film history, you have the 50s and the 60s, everything went nuts. And the 70s, they changed. And the closer you get to what we watch now, it's super ultra realistic. The 50s is a completely different vibe to watching a film. It's almost like you're watching a play sometimes. It has this feel. But that's just the style of the time. Just to backtrack one second, Michael mentions Hawks. For those of you who don't know, that's Howard Hawks, who was a more serious film director at the time then i think you know then so-called you know sci-fi back in the 50s were mostly shock giant creatures yeah yeah that kind of genre you know that, that's why this movie is a little bit distant it builds up the suspense and everything else well this is before the giant creatures i mean king kong was 33 yeah we had the giant dinosaurs the giant behemoth and all but this was a little different so uh I, well, this was this was pre-godzilla Oh yeah, Godzilla was fifty four. Okay, this started before the big, 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 big before the giant creatures. But I'm just saying, <laughs> big, big <laughs> giant. Film. The, you know, the, but then again, sci fi movies was started with you know the, the space, you know the flying saucers. You right. know, this was started the flying saucers. Plus, but this is also the Red Scare. This is also right. the, the, that, the, 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 the communist think, overtones are in these films. Well, that's why they bring in the military. The military mm -hmm. is it's fifty one. We're after World War Two. We're still 
you know, the Americans are good guys and right. the soldiers are good guys. and that, that. Everybody's worried about nuclear exposure and, and right. nuclear bombs and this and that. And in this film, for example, if you look at the overlying theme, if you're looking at, you know, yes, you do have the monster, but the monster really is, I don't want to say secondary, because the biggest conflict you're having in this film really is scientists are on one camp thinking about, you know, we have, must communicate, we must try to make peace, we must try to understand each other, which I guess represents like the more like the liberal side of the country. And then you have the military saying, no, the only way to protect you is to kill the threat. And that's the only way to make sure that, you know, we get rid of this. So you have the, you know, the right side of the aisle. And at one point in the movie, you even have the military's bosses giving them instructions that are slightly contradictory. And it's like, wait a minute, the, the you know, it's like, don't trust the scientists, don't trust the upper level military. You got to trust the guy in the middle. And the guy in the middle is your typical soldier, which at the time, I guess for a lot of these movies, is like the grunt, you know, the, the man on the street type of soldier who is supposed to be the person you identify with. Exactly. Uh, but again, you got to stick at it. This is 1951. Uh -huh. This is this is starting, you know, after World War II when, when, when nuclear power is it's radiation. The only thing they kept doing is they get the Geiger counter out. Oh, my God, it's radiation. So radiation is <laughs> evil because, you know, the whole uh, – we just started, like I said, in nuclear power. What's going to happen, you know, so that's – so – that's why the military's there and everything else. So and like, even Mike mentioned, I remember, we were watching the movie and all of a sudden when you see the scientist, it's like the scientist looks very stereotypically something. And after we were watching it, Mike goes, wait a minute. I think he, he was like, this resembles a certain type of bad guy of the time. He looked like a Russian. Yeah, he had the, the Russian furry he hat. Had the hat. And the, the, beard, the coat and the, the turtleneck. Coat, the turtleneck. The goatee, and you look at him, and he looks like he's a Russian. Right. And you're at the Cold War. Now, let me go back a little again and try to differentiate, because this is something when I first watched it, like a little over a week ago, I watched it on cable, and I watched it on the, let's see, the Turner Classic Movies. And while I was watching the movie, there were three or four scenes in the movie where all of a sudden, the quality of the stock of the film change while you're watching it not even necessarily between cuts but in the middle of a scene a person is talking and then from one word to the next everything looks a little blurrier a little older a little scratchy and grainier and i couldn't at the time figure out why is it that this film like is this film like deteriorated so much that there's no clean copies available and they can only show you these weird prints but then mike made a point today that what those actual points were what exactly that refers to that's the original movie it got edited down when they put it on TV and other versions of VHS tape where they took some of the scenes out. It's not like a half hour worth of footage, but it's unusual that they would decide to snip 10, 15 seconds here, 20 seconds there. It's like very odd. Yeah, and one of the bigger things that they clipped out was when Nikki and the captain, they sit and have a game where she ties up his hands and she feeds him drinks. And like that's omitted from the a lot of the, the copies that are out there in VHS tape and all. But again, if you look at it, when it, it starts out, he's described and you can tell that he's a wolf. He's a womanizer. He goes after the women. You know that there's some kind of connection between them. There's a, a relationship that they start building upon. And if you hear some of the dialogue that Hawks is known for, he puts in that. He goes, well, last time you acted like an octopus. Well, she wanted to make sure she ties his hands down. He's not going to act like that again. His crew is always picking on him about, oh, Nikki, oh, yeah, what's up at the North Pole? Oh, I heard there's a pinup babe. I mean, there's so many comments about it. It just shows that, yeah, he's in love with her. They obviously start a relationship. And that's one of the things they, they took out. Why makes no sense, but I guess it's got to be something with time and TV and for some other reason. It must be editing because most people want to see a so-called suspenseful monster movie or sci-fi movie. They don't want a romance. They don't want – plus these are, say, on TV for kids or if in movie theater, it's for kids mostly. So, like, you know, sci-fi movies for kids, so you can't have the romance over the tones, so yeah, but, to speak. But at the same time, they made that in 51. So if it's in the theaters and that's the original version, why would you take it out when it hits the VHS tape? But also you mentioned earlier off mic that – it's also weird that you try to develop your female lead, let's say, but 
traditionally in these type of films, you at certain point you would put her in peril where she has to be rescued or something, and there's a big payoff in that sense. But here, they didn't do that. They completely did not bring her to the forefront in terms of having her in danger, so she has to be rescued. She's kind of in the background with everybody else, and she kind of pops in, says hi to everyone, delivers a few lines, and goes back in the background. She's never isolated, and she's never you know made a target, a direct target. It is kind of odd in the beginning... Again, you talk about the relationship, and they show that it's there. But other than the relationship, and she takes notes for the Dr. Carrington, she really doesn't do anything else. There's no big payoff. There's nothing that she saves a day. But again, like you said, she's a strong character. She's not the damsel in distress. Right. She actually helps protect the rest of the people by, oh, you should read those notes. Oh, by the way, you should slug me first. But she whole- wants to pass it on because she wants to protect the rest of the company and the other scientists. At first, she's the 1951 secretary and takes the notes, but she's not the 1953 screaming damsel in distress, as you say, going, save me, save me, uh, you know. You know, she's stuck in the corner and quivering on the, in the side. And like like you just said, she's that, a more but, strong female character for the time, I think, than... Right. But she's stereotypical. She was a secretary, and they showed her, you know, taking the notes and pouring the coffee and stuff. But yet, she, she, you know, she wasn't hiding behind the hero and goes, oh, my hero, save me. Well, just go back to when the thing comes into the rec room and they start throwing the kerosene on there. She's standing there with all the men fighting him off. But what's she doing? Yeah, she's standing in a corner with the mattress to protect her. But she's not screaming, oh, my, you know, screaming and that big loud screams you're used to. She stood there. The thing swipes at her. Mattress catches on fire. But she never screamed. And it shows that she's a different type of character. She was a very strong. She was one of them. Unlike one of the soldiers that panicked and then thought the guy threw a glass of water on his face to calm him down. Oh, well, but that's hysterics, yeah. Well, wouldn't you kind of freak out if you had a space alien came out of a block of ice and you have a big shadow and yeah, you but would they, freak out too? Yeah, I guess, but but still, if you figure if he's just sitting there for two hours reading a book and, and tie him up, doesn't notice that doesn't listen to all the water dripping behind him. But that's beside the point. Well, yeah, we can get into those little quirks that don't make sense but that's that's the thing there are certain things you cannot get away from in this movie in terms of the cliches of the time you can't get away like you said the guy being splash the water in the guy's face like a glass like you're gonna grab a glass of water and aim it at somebody's face and throw the water at him it's very theatrical it's very melodramatic which again it's the style they're not trying to be cheesy about it it fit the style of the time now, let's talk a little bit about the comparisons. of. There were certain things I saw here that reminded me so much of the Carpenter version that I think maybe they purposely kept it because they wanted to, you know, like honor this film. And one of the things well, I noticed is the, the long hallway with the wooden planks on the floor, which in Carpenter's version, they use it in a completely different, more action-oriented way, but you do have that long hallway. The other thing I noticed was that the room where they keep the ice block creature in the Carpenter film with that little stairs that goes up the... up. With the, with the rail, they have a similar one here too. I wonder if they purposely did that. If they wanted to try to replicate, obviously not only the story, but try to get some of the sets to look very much like the original. Well, I would think so. I mean, John Carpenter being a director, he's got to be influenced from all the movies he's oh, watched. Oh, yeah. He, he, and you look back, he was a kid when that movie came out. He loved it the way a lot of other kids loved it, and that's why he became a director. So, of course, you want to pay some homage to the original movies. And he wanted also to pay a little more homage to the original script, which was about a shape-shifting creature. Because I think Carlos had said, you started to read it, but didn't finish it. And I haven't read that short story in many, many, many years. I don't remember what's in it. Reading that story, I picture... McCready and all of the Carpenter gang because they follow it so much more. Here, they added the military aspect to it, which the original story doesn't have. And in the original story, they're all scientists. So similar to the uh, Carpenter version. But that's what you're going to get. It's going to change. It's going to formulate different ways of viewing the same story. Well, even even the homage, even the basic thing, like, you know, had the, 1951, they had the kerosene fire, trying to take care of that, and then the carpenter had the flamethrower. You know, way they both, you know, they're very similar in a way, okay, let's try to get rid of through fire. It's, it's, and they even mentioned that in the, scene, in the scene in the 51, I wish we had a flamethrower. <laughs> you know, then you see John Carpenter, with, with, you know, you see Kurt, Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell blowing him away with, with a flamethrower, you know. Or trying to kill him with a flamethrower and such. You know, and just to touch on another thing, you look at this movie came out in 1951. It's really aliens. It's alien. 
it's you putting people in a remote location. They're cut off from the outside world, and you're throwing in a monster, and they got to survive. That's alien. You put them on a spaceship. Similar type of movie. And granted, in this film, the body count is not that high. If you think about it, two people die in this film, and they die off screen. You don't see them getting killed. They mentioned that the creature cut their throats and hung them upside down or something to get their blood or something. But you don't see that happening. Another guy gets injured. The lead scientist gets injured also. So, But obviously, it's the 50s. You can't go crazy with violence, you know, so you can't really go that nuts. I mean, you put this film next to the Carpenter version, and it's a complete well, exactly. bloodbath. And you got to realize in the 80s, <laughs> gore was very popular. Right. Motel Hell, Friday the 13th. So, of course, Carpenter's upping the ante. He's making the creature more gory. Yeah, this is 1951. Just the fact that you had a space alien and a spaceship and they found one is enough as a kids back then to make them scary. That just is scary to begin with. It's a different generation, obviously. Another thing that's similar between the written story, the original short story and this film is the fact that when they uncover the ship, the spaceship, they try to kind of loosen the ice by blowing it up with thermite or something like that. And in the process, they destroy the ship. That's different than the Carpenter film because in the Carpenter film, they don't destroy the ship. They just grab what they find and they get the hell out of there. But I guess to kind of wrap things up and so we can focus on the creature and not so much on the ship, they decide in the story to blow up the ship to kind of get it out of the story. Put it aside. You don't go back to that ship. Yeah, and uh, just going back, as we were talking about horror ideas and you want to make it scary... You've got the super carrot, as they describe it. But look at that scene where you have the arm that's laying on the table, and it starts ingesting the blood, and it starts moving. Come on, think about that. That's like Force. that's scary back in the 50s because it's not a space monster. Yeah, he's got claws and stuff, but oh my God, this one feeds off of human blood. Well, More think... horror aspects jump in there, and it makes it scarier. Well, for its time, I'm sure, you know, just so, you know, seeing a arm on the ground they pick up the arm and they show the dogs getting killed and the whole bit so it's like you know for the 51 that's like oh my god and then the hands start moving and that that's creepy just even now if you see a movie with the hands just that's <laughs> creepy like you know, watch those zombie movies but you would say like from the 51 to the 79 78 80. 81 82. 82. 82. Yeah, it was a big 82 year. I should have known. 82. 82. One of the big years in sci-fi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything came out in 82. And it's our generation for the most part. But do you see, Michael Carlos, do you see the, from the 82 version to the 2011 version, they tried to... It wasn't exactly a sequel. It wasn't exactly a continuation, really. Kind of. But it really was, but it wasn't. Well, the latest version was a prequel. Everything that takes place in that movie takes place before the Carpenter movie starts. It leads to that point. So it's a direct prequel. What's interesting is that in the Carpenter film, you do see some old like VHS footage of the team gathering around the spaceship and holding hands and doing that whole type of thing. But I don't think it's supposed to be a sequel. Carpenter was a complete remake of this film. Right. But that's what I'm saying. Was you, so was that, was that scene supposed to be, be an homage to the... It's 50, an homage. Everything, oh, yeah, everything has to be an homage. You know, it's like watching a black and white version of the scientist all holding hands trying to determine how big it is. In the Carpenter film, the ship is supposed to be way, way bigger. I think here it's pretty small. It's almost like a one-man, I don't want to say a fighter, but a, a one-man small saucer. Speaking of saucers, that's the other thing about the, who goes there, is that you have the same situation where the creature is loose, shape-shifting into different bodies, and trying to build his own little spaceship hidden from everybody else, just like they did with Carpenter. Right. So, again... With Carpenter, everything is in reverse. It's impressive how much he tried to go back to that original written story, but at the same time, tipping his hat at this film because this film is the only thing he had to use as a as a roadmap, I guess. And like Mike mentioned, Hawks was a big guy back then when John Carpenter was young. Not just, forget science fiction, you know, westerns and action films and that sort of thing that Carpenter was a big fan of. You know, it's his homage to that film. Speaking of being an homage to the original... Maybe we should just go around between the three of us. Let's go back, and we all love Jargon Carpenters, but I know you guys already did a, a podcast. Let's go back to the original. What's your favorite scene from the movie? And number two, from this one, Thing from Another World. And number two, why do you think, even to this day, you can still watch it and enjoy it? All right, I'll give you mine. I think my favorite scene in this film is when they discover the ship. 
the whole sequence of them walking to it, trying to figure out what it is. Now, it's funny. While I'm watching it, I'm thinking, oh, this would have been so much better if they do this. They should have done that. They should have shot it from this angle. But the mystery is there. In other words, the film changes completely once the creature is loose. Up until this point, as an audience member, they're kind of leading you down a rabbit hole. And the fact that, you know, they only show you the, like, the fin of the spaceship and it's, like, sticking out and you're like, ooh, I wonder what, you know, you want to see what's underneath and whether it's done that way because they can't afford to show you clear ice and what's underneath. But you, you see the shape roughly, but you don't really see the whole thing. You have to kind of imagine what the ship looks like. I enjoyed the suspense, just to, like you said, the build up the suspense. As you say, three quarters of the movie don't even see the creature. It's up in shadows. So I like that aspect of it. It's called, it plays with your mind more. People are spoiled now with, you know, the special effects or CGI. Kids these days, they would, but that's what they want. They want instant gratification. They want to see the monster. They want to see the gore. They want to see the blood and gore and the giant monsters attacking people. People don't realize you, you, the true suspense comes from the mind. And if you could think of that, like even the guys standing around, okay, the, the spaceship wasn't so big, but it was still, there was like 15 men standing almost holding arms around. So if you think about it, at the time, Especially with UFOs and, you know, from Roswell and everything else back then. It's like, it's, it's a typical round flying saucer with the fins sticking out. So as you, you, Carl said, you're thinking about it, what that ship really looks like. What can it look like? So they destroy the ship. So so obviously, if they ever did, did leave the planet, there's no evidence, you know, that, that, that he was ever there. So they can't really prove it. So that plays with your mind, too, that they're still out there waiting to come to get you, so to speak. For me, I mean, I like a lot of parts in the movie. One, just to answer the question, why I think it still holds up today, is a lot of the characters. You got a lot of talking and banter. They seem like normal people at times, especially in the beginning. And like they talk about, oh, you know, UFOs are hoaxes, and this, they're reading through the manual. And as they joke around, what was that from? Oh, that was section 28 slash 29, section 4, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, that one. Like he's pretending he remembers that. But it's just the point, you're going to joke around. You like a lot of the characters. Yes, when the alien shows up and the thing is there, all of a sudden now they become serious and they're going to take care of business. But I, I still think a lot of the, the vocabulary and the playing off each other and even a little bit of the love story, even though, yeah, it's there. It doesn't move the movie along that much, but still shows that there he's a normal guy. Also, the captain, when you first see him in the beginning, they're playing poker. So he's used to being bluffing. He's got that face he doesn't smile and even you look at him you know, he doesn't really smile through most of the film other than when you're talking to to nikki but again he's a soldier and he's in the command he's got to be that hard as nose hard rock and that's why when the party is being endangered he doesn't care what his orders are he wants to protect the people he's doing his job as a soldier so i mean those are things that i like from the movie again special this one scene that i always like i guess it's iconic but when he's in the electric fly trap and the thing is there and the lightning bolts are flashing and they're all standing there i just you see that and you go wow isn't that cool <laughs> and that for was probably that was... the only effect shot really in the whole movie yeah, I would imagine that's got to be the one because you know, back then, remember the 50s, everything's practical. Yeah, I mean, other stop motion, there was no stop motion. Uh, uh, any type of, um, I don't know, what do you call blue screen back then? Uh, rear projection or... Uh, well, I don't think there were no, uh, there was no blue screen. I think you had the matte, mats, the matte paintings, matte paintings, and maybe some of that. Well, was matte animation. Paintings, I'm not the, sure. the scene you're talking about, the the, the lightning bolts, uh, they're either superimposed real lightning bolts from a from a device, from one of those scientific devices, or animation draw, hand drawn. It's, it's one or drawn, the other. Drawn on the cell. I don't remember exactly possible, what they call it. Possible. Possible. So. The other thing I, I always wanted to mention uh, that I almost forgot is another thing that's different in the story is that in this film. The ship crashes in real time. In other words, they go out there because somebody took pictures of a ship coming down and crashing, as opposed to the book, the story, or Carpenter, where the ship has been already crashed there for thousands and thousands of years. So that's another little difference in the way they present the story to you. Yeah, and I think that's just some way to move the story along a little quicker. And give you reasons what's going on. And again, it also goes back to the Russians. You're at the North Pole. And with the comments, oh, you know the Russians, they're like flies around the pole. You see a craft of some metal right. that crashes. The first thing you think of, oh, we're being invaded <laughs> by the Russians. This is the 50s. So we got to go up only... there and find out. And who do you send? You don't send a scientist. You send the military because that might be the Russians have a secret weapon that's going to attack the U.S. Not only... And I think that's the reason why they did that. 
not only is it the 50s in terms of, like we mentioned before, the specific acting styles and stuff like that, but you also got to remember everything having to do in the movie theater, as far as kids goes and stuff like that, it's flying saucers. It's all about flying saucers and men from the moon and blah, 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 invading the earth. But it's also different than now in terms of, yeah, right now we have science fiction movies and horror movies, but back then you actually had reports of UFOs. People were making these reports and obviously everybody was being dismissed as kooks, most likely the way they were treated, you know, anybody claiming to have seen a UFO, but it was almost like an epidemic back then because that was the whole beginning of, you know, the testing of flights and people see weird stuff and they automatically assume it's one or the other. So it kind of permeated society. The people claiming to have seen UFOs and films being made that had to do with UFOs. So that was all part of the, the story of the time. Is this like War of the Worlds? You know, it's post the radio War of the Worlds and pre the film War of the Worlds. So you're in this period of very heavy sci-fi themes and, you know, this movie kind of fits right in there. Oh, sure. Then we had the day the Earth stood still, more flying saucers that came in. And again, I think also what they try to do is make this movie a little more serious. And I think, Carlos, you had said it before, it's not campy. How you can have the weird monsters coming out and make it look no, silly no. and No, you can't goofy. do the rubber monsters with the tentacles and that. stuff like that. But like we mentioned before, I really would have liked to seen. I mean, it's a shame because, I mean, most of this stuff, it's so old that it's been destroyed and lost. But it would be nice to see some of this test footage of the other alternative monsters they tried doing, you know, stuff like that. Or some making off type of featurette. And unfortunately, on a DVD, this old, they really don't have it anymore. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of stuff just gets lost. But you never know, maybe one day it'll pop up in a personal collector may have something. You always hear that about even King Kong, the big spider pit sequence. You know, one well, day... dinosaur sequences. Yeah, it'll just pop up. Well, the spider pit. Remember, you're supposed to have the giant spider that comes in and attacks. Has that ever been found or not yet? Never been found. But there's one picture. Other than, well, Peter Jackson, as Mike just said, That's he right. did it. But there is one picture of the spider. So they know it was filmed, but they never found it. I think the best way to kind of keep this movie in the mix is that whenever they print a version of John Carpenter's The Thing, they should, especially now that it's on Blu-ray and you have so much space on a Blu-ray disc, include this movie in it. Keep it there as a bonus feature. You want to see where this came from? Watch this. Just like, Mike, you mentioned that your Laserdisc copy of this came with the, the, Short the, story. the, the video, you know, the step-by-step -step video text of the short story so it's like group these things together so they don't get lost so you don't lose one or the other you know if you want to buy that short story it's a little difficult that difficult but it could be a little pricey trying to find these books you have to go to ebay and look for these things luckily we found the website which is outpost 31 which we mentioned before it's a big john carpenter the thing website but it does have you can if you scroll through the website you can actually read who goes there they have it in the website so that's kind of cool by the way to let everybody know yet yeah, the day the earth stood still came out the same year 1951 well big year for sci-fi movie <laughs> so i guess here's one question it sounds like carlos enjoyed it and i'm i'll be honest this is one of my favorite classic sci-fi movies my question to you mike and carlos is would you recommend this to anybody and do you think is it still holding up today Definitely. I really think it definitely stands up. It's classic, and I hate the word sci-fi, it's a classic suspense sci-fi. It's classic for its time. But then again, as Mike says, this is 1951, before the giant guys in rubber suits, and before, but, but everybody had up to ante from there. And then I think kids watched this movie and thought it was suspenseful, but then they want something more. They want to see the creature more, so they, so they show the guy in the suit a little bit more. And then it became more crazy monsters and crazier monsters and, and like you know goofy guys with with with, with uh with fish balls on their head and the gorilla suits right, right. you know <laughs> this was an expensive movie back then what made a little more than a million dollars of course to, to make this like oh, 1.3 million dollars which it's a lot of money back then well, back then but this, these days that's like you know that's a catering bill Basically, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it costs more than Will Smith's trailer. Yeah. <laughs> no, I definitely agree with that. Mike in terms of this would fall on the category of classic, meaning original sci-fi films. Just like you mentioned, The Day That the Earth Stood Still, that is a classic sci-fi film. Now, keep in mind, like Mike also said, for every The Thing, you have probably a hundred Plan 9 from Outer Spaces. So it's a matter of volume and ratios. You do have, for every good film, you're going to have a lot of really cheesy, bad, over-the-top type of bad, bad films. And this one kind of moves up a couple of notches because it works. It functions. Now, again, you can't compare it exactly to a modern film. 
unless you really, really love old films, it's apples and oranges. But even if you are, like, I'm more into the modern films. I know, Mike, you're more into, you like, you really Everything. like the older films. But I can appreciate this film enough to say, this is different. This is very different than your typical schlocky, cheesy See, old film. But again, Hawks didn't want to go for a cheesy, schlocky because he was a big director he didn't make schlock movies mm -hmm. he didn't make campy movies and that was part of the reason when the movie was made yeah they spent 1.3 million and it was rumors that he actually wanted to use more a-list actors and actresses because he wanted to take it serious and put but, uh, a lot of money into it but the problem is that a lot of times back then and even now let's say for example some of these serious hollywood directors might not want to venture into the sci-fi fantasy horror realm because it would be categorized back then probably as the cheesy stuff, the stuff that you can do on the cheap and it's not very respected and it would be unusual, I think, most of the time when a big director did choose to do that. Yeah, and to tell a story with that, you could read about this and there's a great book, Keep Watching the Skies, the tagline from the end of the movie, but it was released by Bill Warren and it's all the 50s sci-fi movies and he talks about the story how there is a mystery and debate on who actually directed the movie because Hawks didn't put his name on it it was going to be a sci-fi movie. He's been known for all the other movies that the other director that gets credit for it. But who is actually directing it? So it's actually really neat. If you're really into it, it's a great little article that just to read. You can hear some uh, fascinating things. So, But that's just the point. You don't want to sit and make a cheesy movie. He wanted to make something that was good. And he wanted to pump money into it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But he put his name on to produce it. And that was... That because that'll help sell it. Right, because it's, it's Howard movie Hawks. By Howard Hawks. Or, you know, produced by Howard Hawks, so it has to be, it can't be the normal sci-fi schlock, or, because sci-fi is like, back then in the early 50s, was yeah. was considered like comic books, you know, for kids, for... Uh, Drive-ins, Matt right. Ray's, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the, the cheapy ones. That kind ones. of stuff. Not very respected. Well, anyway... I would like to thank everybody, uh, Michael and Michael, today for joining me today. I hope we get to do a couple more of these soon. Uh, you know, we'll dip into every now and then to these older films, uh, whether they're super classics or sometimes we might even hit something super cheesy because sometimes these films are so not considered high class, they become their own, they have their own aura around them in terms of how they become something else, something yeah. bigger than they were. Yeah, these movies get lost in today's movies. You guys know... I like the older movies because the producers and the directors and the writers from today, this is what influenced them. You can't forget the old stuff. And how many of we talk about remakes of remakes and how they keep remaking a lot of classic movies. And you can see Thing from Another World got remade, got three movies out of it. <laughs> old, you know, old modern stuff. But yes, we will be doing some older films there, folks. Uh, I'm a big supporter, like I said, of the old stuff. And yeah, I'm going to look forward to it. Cool. Well, until we do that, thank you again, all you guys, for joining us, and we will see you here next time on GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. Every one of you listening to my voice, tell the world, tell this to everybody wherever they are. Watch the skies everywhere. Keep looking. Keep watching the skies. Stop! That's not funny!